lots of wheat now, and as I've alluded to, wheat's becoming a lot more of an interesting market for the last 18 months. It's simply been a passenger to what is a very volatile main and feed grain um, market. Essentially, we've seen stocks in decline in 12, 13, and the wheat market's having to respond to regulate the amount of the grain that is used in um, the feed ration. Uh, this is the supply and demand analysis. So again, the green bars there represent production. The blue bars represent demand. Uh, the solid black line is the stocks to use ratio. Headline global numbers in the broken line there is the, is the same calculation, but just for the main exporting countries. So globally, we're expecting to see quite a quite significant deficit in um, world wheat supply and demand in 12, 13, and certainly with, with the larger production there, we see the, the, the prices are closer to 2018 than we're in. 2012 wheat production is relatively disappointing, and the international parallels to what we saw in 2010, which was of course dominated by the Russian grain and subsequent export grain. Russian wheat production in 2012 was seen down to 30 percent on last year. Indian production has been down about 4 percent. Ukrainian production down 40 percent. These are relatively big numbers. Anywhere in North America, where we find year-on-year increases in wheat output, U.S. production up 13 percent as the southern plains recovers from the 2011 drought. Interestingly, the U.S. drought this year is different in both timing and geography. The, the wheat crop in the U.S. Has relatively well because they've escaped and it's been more that absconding that this year was affected mostly um, the grain belt. The Canadian crop has seen 6% higher year on year, although the statistics kind of re revise their forecast slightly lower, but still showing year on year growth. We then have to consider what's coming up in terms of wet supplies mid season in the likes of Australia and Argentina, and we'll go into more details on that shortly. On the demand side, we actually see relatively strong growth. last season and principally that's driven by feed demand and so the role of the market here is to regulate the amount of feed or the amount of feeding of wheat um, around the world it is globally it's a secondary demand and primary role of wheat is to feed people which makes it stock grade and of course the grain stock levels are in decline the global stocks to use ratio is now approaching uh, 25% um, and we say that the global wheat market is in high supply probably not at this stage I think we can say it's taking less abundant and but certainly the stocks to use ratio levels that are meant to export it are of concern. Just to focus on world wheat trade now, this is very much characterized by um, lower Russian availability and really the reliance is going to be on the U.S. exports to fill some of the void left by um, lower Russian exports. Um, and it probably is the only exports that we can. We'll look at some stocks information shortly that will show where the exportable wheat stocks are around, around the world. But currently we are seeing some uncompetitiveness from the U.S. Uh, wheat exports. Certainly we're seeing import buyers trying to stretch the Russian supply as much as possible, trying to get buyers into the European supplies. And hopefully that gets them through um, in time for the Argentine wheat crop to be available. But certainly the role of U.S. wheat is going to be important. India could be an interesting supplier. I'm not showing on this graph, um, but certainly we've seen some interesting export sales coming in from India. There's questions over the export quality. What does that mean in terms of volume availability, but also questions over quality? What's the condition of the storage bins of those crops that have accumulated over recent seasons? I think global wheat trade is becoming more important every year. Certainly, in sort of the areas where we've seen the production increases are dislocated from the areas where we've seen the demand increases. This makes the world more and more reliant on global um, wheat trade, and that requires a stable political arena to allow that. Focus now on um, wheat export prices. And the graph here is looking at uh, Russian export prices, uh, US and uh, French as uh, the main um, competing sources, particularly of the North African market with the likes of Egypt, the world's largest importing country. And certainly, um, as we come into the 2012 13 season, we've seen Russian exports starting to be very, very competitive. Um, and as a result, we've seen some very rapid export progress of Russian wheat. Sales um, at rates, unsustainable rates, we know that the availability doesn't really have to sustain that. And so, as a result of that, that's caused a follow up fear of a 2010 style export ban and restrictions, complicated by the extent that we now have Russia as a member of the WTO, and so makes restricting exports a little bit more um, difficult. But what we 
we've seen since then with Russian exports of spice has been quite a sell down the market the market is very much working um, as it should be um, Russian export price is rising relative to French and US and they could have been positive at the time we only have to look at the, um, the list of purchases by each of the world's largest importer to see how their origins have developed um, and we see some very rapid rise and we're just probably looking to take advantage of the Russian supplies um, at relatively cheap prices while it was available certainly if we come through August into September and now into October we've seen Russian um, origins dwindling we've seen um, the issue of wheat becoming increasingly um, bought and also now we're starting to see Argentine wheat crops starting um, to feature so the market is doing its job in terms of regulating where wheat comes from I'd like now to move away from talking about trade and talking about world wheat stocks um, and the, the state of the world wheat stocks and the current forecast for the end of the season chart here is looking at current forecasts for end season stocks and associated stocks use ratio for 2012-13 and I compared this against the benchmark levels of 2007 8 why am I looking at the end of 2007 8 well that's the year that is the scenario that the world wheat market has to try and avoid that is the year that is the season that the world essentially ran out of exports from um, wheat so it's very much the scenario to avoid and we can go around all of these and see that we've seen a uh, relatively low stocks for, for some key exporting nations. The two areas stand out to me in Rio particularly in this major role possible export possibilities there. But the, the one thing standing between the world and 2007 8 um, wheat scenario is what's happening in the US. That's the real the only major exporter that has good levels of wheat stock and is there acting as the backstop for, for world wheat trade clearly to um, pick up the baton for anything left behind by lower Consider this in terms of a price perspective. The graph here is looking at US maize prices, uh, Chicago maize prices against Chicago wheat. And we see back in 2007 on the left hand side of the graph there the spike that we had in wheat prices relative to maize prices fueled by this lack of um, exportable wheat stocks. We go to the right hand side of the graph now and we see that the spread is starting to widen. So the market is starting to think about rationing the amount of wheat. Stock levels. The key feature further ahead is going to be what happens um, in Australia and Argentina to feed supplies for mid season um, as we come to the end of the calendar year and move into 2013. And there's some key features there that we need to appreciate. Um, we know that the area of wheat in Australia is lower, around 4% year on year, and we've also seen indications of dry conditions, particularly in Western Australia, South Australia, and some, of the, in some areas of the South East. So this is, it stands out quite clearly that we shouldn't expect to see as close to record 30 million tonne crop that we saw um, last season. Instead, the ballpark is around 22 and a half, 23 um, million tonnes. Although it's quite a big drop year on year, it's still somewhere above the 13 million tonnes we saw produced um, in the drought season of 2007, 8, both by no means um, a disaster. But for the prospect of lower production and the prospect of strong export demand, feature is, is another exporter country going down um, uh, stock levels more, uh, I guess, historic to normal levels, following the build-up of those stocks from virtually two harvests in 2010 and 2011. Switch over to, to consider what's happening in um, Argentina, um, and it's a bit of a contrast to what we see in Australia. There's actually some relatively favourable conditions for tree planting. Um, the rains have, the areas have to go on areas and some to stay that's planted and conditions are allowing those crops to be planted. The key issue for Argentina is that the wheat area is in decline, particularly looking at a historical low in terms of harvest area. Um, and that's going to be a limiting factor on production, uh, barring any other weather issues that could build. This could be a direct impact of the export policy of the restricting the um, restricting US farmers to see the full benefit of increases in global um, wheat prices and encouraging them to just diverge quickly to consider what's happening in Argentina because it is becoming a key exporter of wheat uh, of, of grain. The, the, the graph here is just looking at year-on-year -year changes in uh, Argentine crop areas and the first notable thing is to look at how dominant the soybean area is in year-on-year -year growth fueled particularly by the economics. We've got now a, a, a niche crop that's been in, in Argentina but very much more uh, evolving and emerging is barley consistent growth year on year we've seen but what we are currently concerned about is the level of wheat area changes it's almost turning wheat into a bit of a niche crop and to be honest we're relatively similar to the trends we've seen in long term US wheat areas um, we've got 
situation. Um, the slide's actually been updated for you, so you can use it to give you a hand with that data. The slide um, when it came in, it was looking at the US wheat supply, oh, sorry, the EU wheat supply demand based on the China EU Commission. And again, it looks to be finely balanced, um, but the European wheat in principle factors tight carryover stocks from previous seasons. Another year of disappointing um, wheat production for the EU, and meaning that we are, aren't really expecting to see any meaningful recovery and again, it's a decline in uh, EU and EU wheat stocks, taking the stock beat ratio currently forecast at 7.6%, down from around 8% at the end of last season. So it's quite a delicate um, situation. The graph on the right-hand side just looks to monitor the progress of EU wheat exports. So it's currently forecast by the Commission at 14 million tonnes. We compare that against the current export licences being getting close to achieving 25% in the first quarter of the season. And considering there's been quite a dominance of Russian wheat into the marketplace at the moment, uh, progress seems to be on track. So by no means are we looking at a uh, abundance of wheat in the EU. Just consider some key producers within Europe, and it's a bit of a two-sided story depending on where you are. The two main producers of France and Germany typically seem to be relatively well off against a backdrop of um, issues elsewhere. Um, if we look into the French crop, yes, the production seems to be up year on year. The country's equality and the pass rates are slightly down um, year on year compared to the other year. The wheat available, if you look at the, the German production numbers, it's fairly stable, but we have to look into the German quality, which is absolutely key for particularly in the UK context, and we'll cover that later, but we've seen much improved um, harvesting of Going to into the German wheat crop in 2012, 2010, 2011 were dogged um, by difficult harvest conditions and poor quality. You can expect the mean pass rate to move back up close to 90% in that period of time. The German pass rate is around 70 to 72%. I'd like now just to diverge a little bit again and look at sort of the European grain situation as a whole at the moment. Um, as divergent. So just really to consider what's going on with European grain. Now for a number of seasons, and particularly in this graph on the right, um, relatively below par um, grain production across the EU. In 2010 and 2011, that was that was okay because we then draw down stock levels to, to fill the supply gap. In 2012-13, though, yes, we're expecting some further drawdown in stock levels, but we're getting to a level where we, stock levels can't really be drawn um, much, uh, much further. Instead, we really have to be looking at national demand. This graph just looks at the feed demand, the total grain usage in the EU. And again, we can see that there's a year on year um, being relatively low demand for grain based on the historical um, trends. And this is the first area to see um, demand rationing when we're looking at any um, supply demand. So the European grain situation is relatively tight. It's just a combination of many potential issues. Um, some relief from barley from relatively small grain in the European uh, context. This now brings us on to discuss the UK wheat supply and demand situation. The information here was released yesterday. Um, this is the first estimates of the UK wheat supply and demand. And this is an interesting picture here. We started the season with relatively low stocks of below one and a half million tons, which is sounds like the beginning um, of the line. Those stocks had to work tremendously hard to fill supply gaps due to the fact that harvest was delayed by rain. Some areas, but not only did we have thin stocks, but the cover much wider period, and the demand gaps being covered now by those stocks. That then brings us to production. Um, a very disappointing 6.68 uh, tons per hectare in the UK, averaged the lowest level since 1988, and really reflecting the extremely poor growing conditions that we've seen since uh, spring, June, and July. This gives us an overall production figure of 13.6.0 million tons, the lowest since 2007 lower year was 20%, and this was the by a relatively strong area, which came about from a strong economic um, driver and also good weather conditions for planting um, last autumn. This brings us onto a, uh, a, a quite a large area um, of the EMEA increase, which is a really important um, number. Typically, when we're looking at the UK supply and demand, the really important number is saying the growth rate, which is that below numbers that we generally had from the million tons, so we never be far away from it. Um, it's not going to be the same this year, um, and it's probably going to be an issue to watch for debate during the later um, of the season. As a result of all, all of the issues of 
availability is estimated to 120.3 million tonnes per day. Um, and then on here, the contrast to that is the fact that the demand is actually expected to be um, slightly higher. Um, there is some ethanol demand within that number. There is also strong distilling demand that will slow down the demand. and the balance of almost cut in half in feed is being produced with um, million tonnes working on an assumption of a required peak stockload of one and a half million tonnes that only means that one and three quarters of the country is carrying either free stock or satisfied export. So you can see very easily there by looking at some of these numbers that we can see steady market conditions being what they are uh, in a net import situation. It's certainly unusual, it's not unprecedented though we have seen this situation us back to what we had in 2008 in terms of the double crop of 17.3 million tonnes. Historically, at the end of May, this crop was on track to perform the same with the argument that um, anecdotally this poor summer was costing the UK 4 million tonnes of wheat. I'd like now to move on to talk about um, quality, which is again because of the poor growing conditions has been a big issue. Specific wheat, the, 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 this is the latest data from um, the Series Quality Survey. to another way we created um, Venn diagrams to consider um, the, the percentage of samples meeting specific specifications. So here we're looking at the percentage of samples meeting the full spec criteria. So we're looking at just the Madden Group 1 samples. You can see on the left hand side that in 2011 we're going to be doing vintage years for UK wheat quality. 40% is either in the middle, 40% of samples, Group 1 samples were meeting specifications. Contrast that to where we are now. this specific way which is a bit more clear coming down on top. This is just a high quality bread wheat if you uh, unfortunately know if we consider the, the medium quality spec as well where we're lowering the specific weight from 76 to 74 minimum requirement again we're still seeing that again specific weight is the, the uh, limiting factor in samples meeting specifications 31% issues in the UK are marked the fact that it's fund and the graph here is the commission has delivered red wheat prices into the northwest against German AD which is in terms of comparative quality and we can see through 2011 because we have that vintage quality there's no need for us to be seeing the ordinary growth in um, imports if we consider moving through 2012 very quickly the UK market price itself to a level where minimum price is now just become a function of the imported German we need to now be able to monitor the availability of German A and the prices here on the right hand side are actually monitoring um, the import price into the UK. Again, this is the trend uh, of feed wheat and this is that enables us to monitor how available relative to the supply of the European wheat market. German A wheat is, as we started to see, a spread. 